Welcome, everybody. Um, can you all hear me? Can somebody say yes, please? I say yes. Excellent. <clears throat> Uh, welcome to the second um, webinar um, on the theme of PrEP for Women in Europe. Um, we have uh, three really interesting presenters today. Um, but what I'm going to do first as uh, coordinator of PrEP in Europe um, and the person who um, coordinated the last webinar is to run through the previous one because obviously there were people on that who may not be here today and also I think we don't want to necessarily repeat um, the uh, lessons uh, from that um, webinar. Um, I think it's a really important subject and I think it's a subject that has a lot to tell us about the whole of PrEP. Um, there have been um, various recent presentations showing um, I think that um, PrEP for women um, is still um, uh, a subject that's um, um, in its early stages of access in many parts of the world um, and that and may indeed continue to be um, uh, something um, difficult to get until perhaps we have the injectables and things like that available. Um, anyway, the um, what I want to do is just a very quick summary of what we discussed the last um, at the last webinar. Um, these were the three speakers, um, Sylvain Chocchi um, from Paris, who talked about um, uh, basically the biomedical side of PrEP and also the, uh, you know, the dosing and uh, levels reached uh, in women. Um, then Irina Gator, who is a great PrEP champion in Kenya, and who I invited in there for as someone who has experience of working with large groups of adolescent girls and young women in PrEP. And Anna Silverklug from uh, Spain, who has experience of trying to get PrEP for women in the country where the, uh, although the official um, guidelines state that women can be included in PrEP, in practice the coverage guidelines, which are the ones that the local, the, the National Health Service listen to, say only of their sex workers. Um, so PrEP is potentially just as effective for cis women as it is for gay men and trans women. Um, but the HPTN084 study showed 89% additional efficacy of injectable capitaglia in cis women over and above the efficacy of oral PrEP. And it's become clear from data that's about going to be announced at the IAS conference that that's because, as we have seen in many other studies in women, adherence was really quite low. And there may also be um, factors about tissue levels being lower in women and about it taking longer, up to seven days to build up to effective levels. Um, in HBTN 083, which was the, uh, uh, the uh, study of injectables in um, gay men and um, trans women, um, there was a fairly large um, group of trans women and Capitica Rea had 66% additional efficacy overall prep for that group there. Um, uh, I'm not going to go into a great detail there, other than uh, a study of Discovy, um, the new tin of there, as it were, though not so new now, uh, plus FTC, found that levels in the female tract of that particular formulation of, of tenofovir were 100% lower than in the rectum. And so that really does show that we can't necessarily assume that the medical issues, the, the, the drug absorption and dosing issues are going to be the same as for women as for men. Nonetheless, we do have studies uh, that show that PrEP can be very um, efficacious for women. Um, and we have high hopes for the, newer, the newest drugs, which can be done with implants and subcutaneous injections. As yet, they're not available. They are being studied right now and in trials is Latrovir and Lenacapavir. Um, Irene talked about her considerable experience of being a peer ambassador for young uh, adolescent girls and young women in Kenya, um, and in particular the qualitative studies they've done, uh, which involved 240 participants in 10 dialogues. Um, trust in PrEP, access to PrEP and control of it were dominating issues here. Um, uh, the young women in general found um, a lot of good things about PrEP. They um, were relieved about the safety from HIV and the stress about it. Um, the, 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 the relief also from the potential disruption that becoming infected in HIV can cause a young life. Um, and some people found a reduction in experiences of stigma and gender-based violence. Others, however, found more, you know, 
some disliked the pills, would wait for injections. Um, some did combine it with oral contraception and found multiple pills confusing. And the sort of concerns that we're used to in PrEP, um, it doesn't stop STIs. Um, should I still use condoms? Does it mean that I'm a bad person? Um, and also one really interesting thing was that they were afraid of side effects. Now, some of those side effects are ones documented um, with oral PrEP, such as sort of relatively short lasting nausea and stomach um, issues while the body gets used to the drugs. Uh, but others were clearly ones associated with different HIV drugs that they assumed were side effects due to PrEP. And, you know, they're not. Um, stigma, as I say, um, came up uh, again and again. Health stigma associated with suspected HIV. People thought they might have HIV. And the moral stigma associated with PrEP and distrust of healthcare workers. However, these... Um, uh, these issues were taken to the Kenyan Health Ministry and now form part of the Kenyan Health Ministry's uh, PrEP um, guidelines, which is great. And are really talking about issues that are rather typical of quite a number of European and other countries. Um, in Western Europe, there are, it is possible for women to get PrEP, but they are hemmed in by quite a lot of quite restrictive criteria and a lot of guidelines. They have to be, you know, more so even than gay men. Um, you know, you have to have an HIV positive, un virally unsuppressed partner, or you have to tell them that you are a sex worker, not easy. Um, or you have to say, I am a woman who inject drugs or whose partner does. Um, and they did have some sort of catch up, ca you know, catch all clause as they do in other countries about women with social care vulnerabilities. But in practice, the document that actually issued to hospital pharmacies said, only women mentioned were sex workers. So um, restrictive criteria can lead to even more restrictive distribution. Um, there's no promotion campaign other than those promoted to the gay community. And even if women are and disclose that they are uh, female sexes, because they may find it hard to talk about the vulnerabilities involved in that work. Um, lastly, um, Anna, as I'm sure the rest of us would, um, advocate to press PrEP access via and training for healthcare workers who women actually trust and meet, such as gynecologists, midwives, GPs. Um, and so it's very important that countries like France have extended PrEP provision to GPs. In America, I know they are doing a lot of work um, in gynecology clinics and family planning centers. That's how we need to get PrEP to women. Um, I'm not going to go through the questions, um, but other than the one about criteria are not good on seasons of risk. It is very difficult to get PrEP if you don't say I am already at risk. Um, if you say I worry that I might become at risk because I've started a new relationship, I moved to a new country or whatever, it's very difficult to, um, to sometimes persuade healthcare workers to provide PrEP. At the moment it is perhaps gatekeep, <laughs> word I'm just going to gate, make up, gates kept um, too much, that the healthcare workers worry about giving it to people who may not need it too much. Um, I think that it's, I'm a very much an advocate for um, demand, the demand side of PrEP, and to educate people who might benefit from it, because uh, the data shows that when people are fully educated about PrEP, they are generally good judges of their specific risk and can take PrEP and do take PrEP when and as it is needed. So that's key. And mine, in the last slide, I would like to thank everybody who has uh, been part of this um, webinar and in particular, Bart's Health NH Stress Trust, which is where um, Kim works in the All East Sexual Health Clinic. There's a fire forum, which, um, um, Sophie Strachan um, is coordinator of, um, is that coordinator? Oh, anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, and Olga from the Alliance for Public Health. I hope she's able to join us. And Harriet's um, organization, which I will not try to say in German. <laughs> okay. Um, so thanks very much. So my, my name's Kim Leverett. I, I'm a nurse practitioner working in East London. Um, I've worked with sex workers for over 20 years. The majority of that time has been with off-street migrant sex workers. In the past, I worked for an outreach service and also ran a clinic. However, due to changes in commissioning, I'm now exclusively clinic-based. 
And I'd like to tell you um, our experience of recruiting women and others for PrEP. So first of all, we had an opportunity. We had this great opportunity of working in a designated sex work clinic. And that ran twice a week, seeing sex workers for sexual and reproductive health care. The clinic was both walk-ins and appointments. And appointments could be made via a smartphone. The majority of the service users are cis women spanning the ages of 18 to 62 years. And approximately 80% are migrant workers, mostly from South America and Eastern Europe, Brazil, Romania, and Poland being the most common countries. So prior to the IMPACT trial, that's the trial we started in 2017 in the UK, we had very limited HIV prevention tools available for women. So it was pretty well exclusively condoms and PEP. Some of our service users have condomless vaginal and or anal sex at work or in their private life. And they were coming in regularly for testing and had ongoing concerns about HIV. None of our cis women had ever heard of PrEP and therefore they weren't familiar, confident or financially able to purchase it online. Because PrEP was a relatively new treatment and not targeted at women, there were very few preconceptions or misgivings about PrEP in our service user group. And we found it was actually readily acceptable. So we developed a model um, and it had three strands, um, net reach, promotion and communication. So the first strand, net reach. Net reach can be described as the use of digital technologies to provide information and support to sex workers. To maintain an outreach component to our clinic based service, we had been reliant on net reach methods using a smartphone for over two years. And we found WhatsApp to be more popular than text. Once the impact trial started, we called and messaged service users who had told us in the previous three months they were having condomless sex at work and explained how PrEP may be of benefit to them. We invited service users to come in for further discussion at appointments where they could commence the research trial. We often needed to use a mixture of professional telephone translation, Google Translate and face-to-face -face interpreters. And this was our normal practice in this clinic. So we backed this up by sending links about PrEP and women via WhatsApp. And we also encourage service users to spread the word to their colleagues. We know that for those working in the off-street sex industry, there's often downtime between customers where individuals have time to check in with their colleagues. All those commenced on PrEP and those unsure about whether to start had a follow-up call or WhatsApp conversation two weeks later. This gave service users an opportunity to ask further questions and, dis and discuss any side effects. So the second strand of our model is promotion. For all new and follow up service users, we made time to discuss PrEP. To those eligible, they could nearly always start on the day of their appointment. Prior to the impact trial, we had HIV prevention topics on our sex work health pro forma. This included PEP and condom use. Now we added PrEP to our health pro forma, so this was routinely discussed. The third strand of the model is communication. We began in-house training 
So our larger team were confident and competent at discussing the values of PrEP for women and others, not just sex workers. We discussed with other professionals challenging attitudes and mindsets. We then shared our experiences with other organisations, street sex work services, at sex work conferences, with a sex work peer organisation, and any opportunities that came our way. So in conclusion, our simple model really was just that of three strands, network, net, net reach, promotion and community. For this model to have worked, we needed trust and championing. championing. Women and others had existing trust in our clinical service. Our clinic had been running for many years and is run by a small, consistent group of staff. And that's probably less than five people. The staff members were on board with PrEP and they were given time to champion it. We also felt it was important that the PrEP champions were the same clinicians that actually delivered the ongoing care. Thank you. Uh, Olga Dinizhuk, um, who is now, I think you better introduce yourself, but you are from the Alliance for Public Health in the Ukraine, in Ukraine. All right, hang on. Ukraine. That's very old fashioned. Yes. Um, that's right, uh, Head of Programme Optimization Research Team for the Alliance for Public Health. Um, you can tell us a bit more about that um, and talk about I think part of the APH's pro, uh, program generally, and also kind of the, the progress towards including other groups, um, other than uh, gay men and transgender people in PrEP within Ukraine. And I think it's really important. This is the first presenter we've had during this series from Eastern Europe. And as PrEP in Europe, we are deeply committed to helping our East European colleagues um, get towards the same levels of HIV treatment and prevention that um, we are benefiting from in some of the countries of Western Europe. So it is great to have you here, Olga. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you, Gus. Thank you, colleagues, for inviting me. So I see many colleagues from Ukraine. Happy to see you too, and those who I don't know. Uh, I'm from Alliance for Public Health. Alliance for Public Health is a charitable organization which is providing services for key populations, including PrEP. And uh, as uh, some of you might have heard, uh, Ukraine is one of the leading countries in Eastern Europe and Central uh, Asia in scope of coverage with prevention services for key population. And this is also relevant for PrEP. Um, uh, we uh, we uh, um, uh, have support from our donors, Global Fund and PrEPFAR to provide social support and um, services related to um, uh, to linkage uh, to linkage to prep for those at risk. However, uh, most of the clients uh, are still uh, from the uh, MSM community, which is uh, which is a win for us as well. But we, of course, want to uh, make those services uh, available for other groups too. Um, how do I switch? Right. Do you see my slide changing? Right. Oh, cool, great. So uh, I, I won't stop here a lot, but I'm sure most of you know that uh, HIV in uh, women is a very important and still in many countries is uh, underestimated um, issue. Uh, and despite uh, HIV being prevalent mostly in key populations and uh, people means people who inject drugs, MSM, uh, sex workers in Eastern Europe, Central Asia, including Ukraine, uh, we still uh, we still um, have women under covered with HIV prevention uh, and treatment services. Um, just a slide about HIV in Eastern Europe and Central Asia. Again, we have fastest growing HIV epidemic in the world, despite all the donor support, despite all the national programs. And uh, we can see that uh, new infections are rising by 72% uh, between uh, uh, 2010 and 2019, uh, and 2019, and uh, it is also important to notice, to, to notice that in 2019 the incidence, uh, uh, which is a prevalence ratio of 
10.1 was higher than in any other region globally. This, uh, this data tells us again that we should, uh, we should improve our prevention and linkage services for those who are in need and those who are in, tree, in, in at risk. And PrEP for us is a, a very important tool uh, which is still underused in many places and in many countries. So if you just dig a bit uh, deeper um, and search for some data about PrEP access in Europe and specifically uh, data which uh, talks about uh, PrEP uh, access for women, there are not many, there are not many uh, studies or articles. However, you can see these are most recent one and um, all, of, uh, all of these three studies of these three uh, articles, they tell us that there is still a big gap uh, between the need of PrEP and the coverage with PrEP. And this is the first one, uh, this is the first one uh, which was evaluating PrEP uh, gap for, for MSM. And the second uh, article um, was a, it's just a recent one. I think it was, it is from the last year and uh, it, evaluated, uh, it evaluated the gaps of PrEP for, uh, for women and um, main barriers were lack of information about PrEP, lack of political support and uh, high costs for individuals in those, in those countries where uh, you can pay for PrEP. Um, there were uh, also an obstacle such as, was also an obstacle such as uh, guidelines which are prioritized in MSM and women not being seen as a target population for PrEP. Um, also the, the article about um, uh, interest in PrEP says that actually when you reach those who are at risk, uh, these women, they will express their interest. But the thing is that information is not there and uh, uh, it, is, uh, it is quite hard to create that demand and bring that service without uh, proper, uh, uh, without proper linking that, uh, bringing the service closer to women. So if we talk of if we talk of violence against women, again, a uh, region of Eastern Europe and Central Asia always somehow stays behind of, uh, uh, of targeting this issue. And this is, this is the data from the recent OCC that survey on violence against women and Ukraine was one of the countries. Uh, and it says that uh, women in, in general, um, they are very much underestimated in this, in this region um, in regards to the violence, but there are high rates of violence to the next uh, groups of women, uh, those who are younger aged and those who are aged and after uh, older than 40, women who have disabilities, they have high risk of uh, violence, women who have children at home, women doing unpaid work in family business, women who face extreme income deprivations, uh, those who survived physical, sexual, or psychological violence in childhood, and uh, women, uh, again, who experienced childhood uh, violence. And on the left, you see the distribution of the forms of violence against women. And it is very much known that uh, women who uh, experience violence, they will also be facing uh, difficulties and issues in access and health care including uh, HIV services. As well as women in abusive relationship are still more likely to base assessments of their risks uh, on their own sexual and drug use behavior outside the relationship uh, than on factors such as lack of condom use or forced sex by the abusive partner. That's why it is also, also important to implement a proper HIV risk assessment. And we all know that uh, medical providers or social workers who are involved in PrEP provision are usually quite busy with other stuff. And we might face a uh, lack of time allocated for proper risk uh, assessment, which may, um, which may put those women at risk aside of this intervention. So uh, we of course want to evaluate sexual uh, health risk indicators such as STI, PrEP, 
PrEP and PEP use and emergency contraception use in pregnancy. Behavior risk indicators are critically important, uh, such as vaginal or anal sex with multiple male partners, condomless vaginal or anal sex with male partner, anticipated increase in number of sexual partners, which is also a, a very important um, characteristic, um, which is not taken into account uh, during the risk assessment, because we usually talk about what has happened before, uh, although anticipated risk should be taken into account. Also relationship risk indicators are important, such as intimate partner violence, as we've uh, discussed in the previous slides, uh, experience in reproductive questions, involvement in an ongoing sexual relationship with the potentially viremic HIV positive male partners, and involvement in an ongoing relationship with male partner of uh, an unknown status. So this and more uh, of other indicators should be carefully assessed and time should be allocated uh, to, uh, uh, to be able uh, to, be able to uh, understand if uh, this woman uh, has any risks, uh, current risk or potential risks in future. As for uh, the PrEP program in Ukraine, uh, we are currently implement, implementing PrEP with the support of Global Funds and PEPFAR. Uh, we have ser services in all regions of Ukraine, and we do it through the local NGOs who uh, are working in partnership with local aid centers. Uh, and uh, primary target population, as I mentioned, um, uh, are MSM. Although we have uh, HIV negative partners, uh, of serodiscordant couples and people uh, who are at risk of HIV uh, infection but are not assigned to any of the key populations. Well, again, I'll show you the graph later. Again, MSM are the key group who receive the services. This is just a quick algorithm on how the program works. So clients, um, uh, clients have an opportunity to undergo screening and and uh, uh, in the NG at sorry at the uh, NGO facilities uh, and those who are screened positive will be further referred uh, to a healthcare facility uh, to initiate prep to do all the needed uh, laboratory assessments and then uh, clients have um, an opportunity to uh, to have social support provided for the next from six to 12 months depending on the project where a social worker will be in touch with the client uh, just to reflect and respond uh, on any issues related to side effects and any issues related to logistics uh, for uh, the uh, prep uh, for the TDFFTC uh, its, uh, collections, uh, collection at the AIDS uh, center or for the needed laboratory tests. So this is a preliminary data, data for, the last, for the last year. There is something on the slide, I don't know what it is. Um, okay, uh, so you can see that majority, 85% are MSM. Then we have partners of people living with HIV, sex workers, people who inject drugs. Uh, we have MSM female partners, people who inject drug partners, sex workers part partners, and the minority are transgenders. But well, again, 85% are MSM. And uh, uh, this is for us. Um, this is for us a success from one side and from another side. It's also information for thinking uh, about how to build those services so to cover uh, other groups, including women at risk. And this is the distribution. This is the distribution of sex age uh, per female and males. You can see that. Um, that groups are pretty similar. Um, most of the people who are enrolled in PrEP are in the age group from of 35, of 30 uh, to 39. And uh, as for, if we look at women uh, themselves, so we have only 10%, 10% uh, of women of all the people enrolled in PrEP. These I'm talking of Alliance of Public Health uh, programs data. Uh, but if, if you look at the national data, the picture will not change much. 
So of all the women enrolled, uh, we uh, see, see that majority are uh, serial discordant are from serial discordant couples. Uh, or sex workers. And then a minority will be from the groups of people who inject drugs uh, and uh, partners of people who inject drugs or partners of uh, MSM. So for the, for the PrEP delivery models, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the main, uh, main model of providing of, uh, and source for, provi for PrEP provision uh, are uh, NGOs, which are doing which are implementing HIV prevention and harm reduction services and eight centers which are responsible for enrolling index uh, uh, for enrolling enrol enrol in zero discordant couple through the index testing and, and other services however however we uh, see the potential for prep uh, provision through the family physician, through the gynecologist or STI clinics, or or uh, uh, services for vulnerable women uh, and HIV-related services in conflict zones, which is also an underestimated uh, area uh, in our country, since we do have a huge conflict zone and the war going on in the eastern Ukraine and we all know that conflict zones and war zones are the potential for increase uh, in uh, HIV, for increase of HIV and STI. So services, uh, services in these areas, which will include PrEP, uh, should be considered, should be considered for implementation. Of course, challenges, demand creation, proper risk assessment, uh, risk screening, STI testing and treatment are very important because currently in Ukraine, uh, it is not covered by, uh, by the national health services. It is very important to reach women at risk who are not from identified key populations, because if you go out in the healthcare facilities to these family doctors, uh, PrEP is not there, people, who are not reached by NGOs, they don't know what is PrEP, they don't know who may benefit from it. So we should go beyond our, our conventional HIV prevention services. And uh, of course, like a social support related to violence should include PrEP as an option for HIV prevention. Thank you very much. And uh, just to finalize it, uh, I'm sure you're all with me on that, that PrEP is more than just HIV prevention. It is about freedom of choice, equity, and self-confidence. And specifically, uh, this is relevant for women. Thank you very much. I'm not sure if I managed to do well with Simon, but I tried my best. Thanks. And this is something like, like a drawing on my presentation. I don't know what to be. Um, I kind of assumed you might have a sort of four-year-old who'd been drawing over your presentation or something like that. I don't know where it comes from. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. It's a great, uh, great synthesis of data, as Yanis has just said. And I really liked your foregrounding of the issue of domestic violence and coercion. Because I think uh, if I can take sort of, a, as it were, a coordinator's um, a privilege to just make a quick comment. Um, the, the thing you said, one of the things you said that was really striking is that women often blame themselves for their risk, um, whereas in fact um, it's very often the risk visited on them by partners um, that is the one that um, people assessing women, working with women, need to think about. And I think that's a really important point. Harriet. Yeah, uh, yeah. Do you want to uh, collect a few from the... Um, chat box and um and actually um yes I'm, I'm i'm prepared to do so but i would really like very much to ask janis because he has put some questions in the chat already so he might as well uh, show himself on our screens and put them again to um have his questions asked to kim and olga janis if that's okay for you to do it in person because there were some I think he, there he is. Great to see you. Hi. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody from my kitchen. And um, really wonderful talks. Uh, thank you to Kim and Olga. Um, and also Gus's uh, great recap from the first webinar of the series. Um, just I'm wondering if you should slightly introduce yourself, Yanis. Sorry. I'm um, 
I'm uh, an epidemiologist uh, based in Geneva, Switzerland, and I consult for WHO. Um, I've worked on global guidelines um, here in, at headquarters at WHO, and now working more on country level implementation and supporting WHO Ukraine um, and partners like Olga at the Alliance and, and others. So um, very much looking at uh, scaling up uh, oral prep and looking at other next generation products as well for Ukraine and, and, uh, and other countries. So um, two questions, to uh, one to Kim. Um, I, I am Greek and uh, we are still trying to introduce PrEP in, in, my, in my country of birth. Um, we have a very um, sort of, we have a significant population of uh, documented, undocumented migrants, refugees in Greece, both in the mainland and the islands. And uh, they have a massive gap in, in you know, sort of an unmet need in sexual reproductive health services. And so I wanted to know a little bit about how the provision of PrEP in the UK and in your clinic for those, those um, uh, migrant women um, who are un undocumented, you know, if, if services were provided to them. That's my question to you. Um, uh, and the other thing, the question to Olga, uh, just really your, your honest perspective on how do you think the use of um, kind of uh, uh, digital health uh, in the context of Ukrainian women um, in both generating demand and like, get, you know, in getting women to know more about what PrEP is um, beyond the women in surrogate couples or in relationships or women who are um, sex workers. Um, you know, if you really see that actually, there's potential for that in making that happen. And the other question I think was about- <laughs> Yeah, Yannis, I don't know if everybody has such a good memory to remember all the questions you're putting here. I, uh, <laughs> so... I in the chat though, so- <laughs> So I, I would suggest that we start with a question you put to Kim first and then go to Olga, if that's okay. Kim, Kim do you still remember what was Yannis' yeah. question? <laughs> and I try to speak more slowly because of the interpretation, but I'm not sure. Yes, please. <laughs> Kim, do um, you yeah, still so, remember? <laughs> uh, yes, because it's actually a very simple answer that um, in the UK, sexual health is, is free for all, regardless of um, someone's status. Um, so that just makes it really simple for us. Um, and a lot of the people that, that um, were taking PrEP, um, a lot of the women that we were supporting, they were taking PrEP, we did know their legal status because often that was part of a discussion um, that just came, at, came out, but we didn't need to know it. Um, so it, it, it sort of feel, feels quite comfortable that it's not a question that we need to ask and everyone can access sexual health regardless of their, their, their legal status. Um, so yeah, we were lucky. I don't know whether um, Vanessa, um, who's uh, my uh, colleague in the service, wants to add anything more to that. Um, no, thanks, Kim. Um, not particularly. I think we are really fortunate in um, our services in terms of it being open access. And rather, I think the main thing for us is making sure that we've um, um, told people that it is free and available because often that message of that everyone is welcome and you are really welcome and we are really not going to charge you and there are no hidden charges can be quite difficult and I think um, as um, Kim highlighted particularly um, within her work um, the trust element was so important because they'd built trust there so there was trust about the services that would be provided but also trust that they weren't going to be if their immigration status was an issue they weren't going to be um, you know caught out etc so yeah Mm -hmm. may, may I just uh, pass on because this goes on trust as well. I'm just reading Andre's question uh, for Kim and maybe for Vanessa as well, because you're talking about trust. And Andre says, what is the trust of ordinary women, men, trans sex workers to the staff of the clinic? And whether the staff are people who themselves are or have been sex workers? Is there something like a peer to peer approach? Um so I, I can I can answer the first one and then perhaps um, Kim, um, Kim will answer the peer-to-peer -peer approach. But what I would say is that um, within 
sexual health services across the UK, we're really focused on making sure that our, because we are open access, emphasizing that we are open to everyone and um, full in diversity and full in knowing that you can come and get free and confidential services. And I think that um, we, do do well in getting that message out, but we can always do better. So I think there is an element of trust there. And I think as soon as people step through the door, um, there is that, okay, I'm in an integrated sexual health service and I'm going to have to open up um, for many aspects of my life. But I do feel that we, we could do better for those groups that have less of a voice and are less empowered and are still mistrustful of all societal structures and we we need to advocate for them more um, but i'll sure. hand over the peer-to-peer -peer work um to kim yeah okay Th thank you very much and um, um as gus has asked uh, me just to take the question janis has asked to olga because we have sophie back here and we're going to have the third presentation before we start the uh, the panel discussion so this is uh, just, um, Olga, do you still remember the question from Janis or <laughs> shall he repeat it? <laughs> uh, what are the ways uh, to uh, reach women who are not covered with, uh, with other prevention services through the dig digital means, right? Yes. So how do we move yeah. beyond like that kind of catchment population we already have? We know like about the kind of the coverage. Right. right. So, so again, we, we are talking that we want to move beyond the key population, but mean, it means that we need to uh, identify other key populations for PrEP, which are not identified yet. And this can be general women from general population, women uh, who are younger age and uh, they uh, use uh, non-injecting drugs or are involved in, a, um, I don't know, partying, uh, sex partying culture, whatever, having young and sexy, beautiful, having fun. So these people, these, especially these young uh, people, they of course can be reached through digital means because there are, uh, this is how they get information. Uh, and uh, now in Ukraine uh, and in other countries, uh, Western Europe and C Central Asia, th there is a tendency to establish a national elect electronic health system where people can get in touch with their family physician, can get some information related to their health. So PrEP can be uh, installed or implemented there uh, for, for those general populations as, as, uh, as long as we'll start using that system more and more. Uh, and secondly, uh, we have programs uh, which are not, of course, enough yet, but programs to cover those younger generation. And PrEP can be provided there as a, uh, as a nicely uh, framed option for safe life and joy. <laughs> and then we can use everything. I don't know, Instagram, Facebook channels, which are now covering with, uh, with ads for parties and stuff. So again, I think the... The most important, I'm, I'm finishing, uh, the most important <laughs> part is to identify who are these key, non-conventional key population. And then we'll, we can start, uh, we can start identifying means to get, uh, to, get uh, to them. So thank you very much, Olga. Hi, everyone. Um, my name's Sophie. Um, I am the current director of the Sophia Forum. I've also been co-chair of the Impact Trial Women and Other Group alongside Dr. Vanessa P, who has been speaking today. Um, and I'm also a sexual health advisor. Oh dear. Um, at the Chelsea and Westminster Hospital. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Okay. <clears throat> Next slide. Is it up there for you? Should be. Prep conversations in 2016, it says. Okay, for the um, total benefits of the European audience, just, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So, um, 
for the European audience, just to give you um, a backdrop of the history of the conversation 16 um, in the context of women um, We there was an assumption that women do not take risks. Um, there was an assumption that women do not take risks and also um, that the perception of not being a risk was a barrier to accessing resources and services, subsequently making women invisible in this conversation. As previously said by one of the other speakers, gender-based violence increases the acquisition of HIV, yet the focus in early conversations was limited to solely that, which portrayed women as disempowered victims, being able to access PrEP, rather than it being framed in the same way as it was for men in terms of empowering, it was enabling us to look after our sexual health and allowing women to have the sex that they had always wanted to have without the concerns of acquiring HIV. Ooh. And back in 2016, there was no tailored information to meet the needs of cis and trans women. Next Sorry. slide, please, Gus. I seem to have gone into my own slideshow. Hold on one second, I'll, I'll delete that. There we are. Okay, okay. so addressing barriers to PrEP knowledge and access. The SOFIA Forum collaborated with iBase, which is an HIV information organization in the UK and developed tailored information to increase awareness and knowledge and the benefits of PrEP for cis and trans women. We also collaborated with individuals and organizations, both globally and local, and developed a website, womenandprep.org.uk. I'd just like to acknowledge the late Paul Deckel, who was a longtime UK activist who passed away recently, who developed our first website for free, and to also thank our former trustee and current associate consultant, Dr. Jackie Stevenson, for all her, for all her advocacy and developing the content with Athena Initiative for the website. And our third point is the continued advocacy for PrEP equity. Next slide. I think I've Moving just on towards up. the end of 2016, we, thank you, we developed the prevention principles, as stated here, that no individual means of prevention should be considered in isolation, but as part of a comprehensive package of prevention. Preference should be given to education programs programs, interventions that are evidence-based, least burdened all, and monitored for impact with data disaggregated by gender, sex, age, and other factors. And always should have the meaningful involvement of all communities that might benefit, including women. Next slide, please. Here, I just wanted to show a snapshot of the leaflet that we developed back in 2016, 2017. This is currently being updated and printed into French, Spanish, Portuguese, Polish and Bulgarian and will be available on our Women and Prep website and also on iBase to download. This is just to give you a screenshot of our Women and Prep website. Um, I've put the link at the, at the end of the presentation and on there you can find all the information that we've put up around Prep for Women and also a little bit later on in the presentation I'll be showing you and talking about the videos that are also uploaded uh, that you can access, sorry, via this website 
as part of the PrEP impact trial women and other group work. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Have you got that one up, the picture with the woman in the umbrella? I, I've, no, I've, I've spoken to that one. It's the next one. Right, sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. So just moving forward to 2017, uh, the PrEP Impact trial recruited just under 25,000 high-risk individuals over three years. Um, early reports signalled a concerning disparity in PrEP uptake. The numbers of women, trans and non-binary and racially minoritised populations and heterosexual men were significantly lower than men who have sex with men. And our group was formed in response to the inequity. It was, it compiled of a group sorry, a community of activists and organisations working with the PrEP Impact Trial Oversight Group, the larger community advisory board and research team. And here I have just noted all the community organisations and individuals that were part of the women and other group. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry. Yep. For the benefits Next. of our European partners, I've literally just put this slide here for you to understand the objectives, trial objectives, um, to measure PrEP eligibility and PrEP uptake um, among sexual health clinic attendees in England. I'm not going to go through every single point on there, I just wanted to highlight it for you. Next slide please Gus. And these are the results. Um, so, as I said, just under 25,000 individuals, 23,217 men who have sex with men, and the other group, which, as I said earlier, uh, formed the women and other group, cis women, trans women, trans men, racially minoritized groups and heterosexual men. Um, the number recruited was 1,038, so less than 5% of the overall total participants. Um, hence, again, the group was formed. Mm. Next slide, please, Gus. Mm. And here's just a breakdown of the figures. So you will see that the largest recruitment by six points <laughs> was trans women, cis women 333, trans men 152. And cis men 150 and 35 non-binary individuals. Barriers to uptake of PrEP is an ongoing lack of awareness, a gender bias, a lack of offer towards women and other groups, and still a low HIV risk perception of risk at clinician and individual level. Next slide, please, Gus. So again, this is a snapshot for our European partners to um, see the Beaver Bash PrEP guidelines which was developed to further support those outside of MSM identifying people. Okay. 
And I think one of the things that's come through and has been said by other presenters is the individualized assessment for people who want to use PrEP. The conclusions, risk assessment for women is much more complex than for MSN, who have the clear indicators of HIV equals estrogen, rectal STI, syphilis, presentations for PEP, and condomless anal sex. When we um, are discussing HIV risk, HIV risk with women, um, framing it in an overall sexual and reproductive well-being conversation will be a, a more effective strategy than in terms of just HIV risk alone. It's crucial to create an atmosphere of compassion and trust to ensure that conversations yield information that will lead to effective outcomes. Um, maybe for time, I won't read all of them out, but there is the absolute need for PrEP champions to promote and deliver ongoing care in all healthcare settings and community spaces. And if you go down to slide 17, Gus, this is just to show you, and you can access this on the Women in PrEP website, the strategy ensuring PrEP for all that was developed by the women and other group subgroup, led by Dr. Vanessa Rapie, who can speak to it um, in the panel discussion. Um, key objectives, PrEP literacy, PrEP candidacy, and PrEP uptake. Next slide, Gus. And um, the combi event, the combi approach of education, advocacy, and research. And just slide 20, just to say thank you. I'm so sorry, but thank you. <laughs> I'm going to hand over to um, Harriet, um, who will. Uh, make the best sense you can of the huge number of really interesting questions that we've been asked. Thank you very much. And thank you again, Sophie. Yeah, and thanks to everybody who stayed with us. And uh, I think we all need some patience when it comes to technical problems. Uh, Sophie, as long as you're with you, you're the first that I'm um, passing on some questions to you that I find in the chat. And one is coming from Anton from EATG, and he asks specifically about women who use drugs. Can you uh, um, uh, say anything about your experience that we have, uh, that, that you could share with us about women who use drugs? Sophie, are you with us? I am. And... Um... It's a conversation that came up recently and in our current PrEP guidelines um, it, it is not recommended for drug users um, and there's a conversation that's going on in Scotland at the moment. Um, I do not have any direct experience in my sexual health advisor role of um, any drug users coming in um, if we are talking about non-CHEMS drug users um, requesting um, PrEP. Um, I am involved in conversations at the moment in prison settings, uh, ensuring that the information um, is um, accessible to those who are incarcerated, which will include a population of drug users. And another question, Sophie, regarding your work. Um, what is your experience in what uh, situation do women uh, start to take PrEP? What is the, the point of entry for, for women that you have get to know? Is it a question to me? No, it's, it's, no. yeah, yeah, it's, it's, I, I hope Sophie has an answer because she's put this, um, yeah. yeah. Yep, I'm still here. So, um, I mean, my work around PrEP started when I was working um, alongside Kim and Vanessa at the Royal London. 
And um, as Kim was saying earlier, um, the biggest cohort of women there were sex workers. Um, in the same way, the sexual health clinic I now work over at in a different part of London, um, they are probably pr predominantly trans women and a mix of sex workers. The cis women that we have signed up for PrEP, um, there were some whose partner was had recently acquired HIV, so therefore didn't have an undetectable viral load. Um, and then we have had a number of women who have come in and self-identified having learnt about PrEP and um, Recently, we had a woman who has multiple male sexual partners from Southeast Asia. Um, so, yeah, I, I would I would say the bigger group of women that that are accessing uh, prep, certainly in the clinic I work in at the moment, are sex workers. Thank, thank you very much, Sophie. I'm scrolling through the chat and there's a question that um, is very close to what we are already discussing. It's from Helen Corkin and she says, um, as some of the presentations already suggested, that we might better focus um, uh, on, on PrEP awareness uh, in services women already ex uh, access like um, drug services, uh, general practice for heterosexual women, contraception, menopause support, rather than expecting them to be proactive and at the same level of PrEP literacy uh, we know for MSM. Um, Sophie, if you're still with us, um, have you learned about um, any attempts by um, gynecologists or even pharmacies like we had in the first presentation in the first seminar? So that is very much a conversation that is um, happening not only at a community level, but also at a clinician level. Um, and I know that there are models being discussed um, one that the Sophia Forum is currently involved in that would be, you know, it's, a, it's, um, it's applying the same model that we did around um, antenatal screening for HIV. So it's going into menopause clinics, it's going into contraception services. Um, there's also, you know, there's community groups advocating that we also, um, these conversations happen at abortion clinics. Um, and that you access PrEP via your GP. Um, but absolutely, as has been advocated by many, um, also, you know, not on this platform, that accessing PrEP needs to happen outside of sexual health clinics. It can't be reliant on, a, you know, the, the sexual health service as it is in, in the UK. So, so to make it as widely available as possible in, in many settings. Thank you very much, Sophie. I'd like to stay a bit in the UK and going back to Kim and maybe Vanessa, as we are still discussing in the chat a drug use. And um, as Anton uh, from EATG puts it, uh, the linkage with harm reduction, um, people who use inject, or, or women who use injecting drugs, uh, shouldn't they be prioritized? And I wonder if Kim or maybe Vanessa, you both, could add to the drug using, injecting drug use on, uh, with women. Could you? Um, yes, no, no, thank you. I, I, I can talk about just very briefly about some of the um, work that we're doing currently. So completely recognize this and, and recognize that there are also, I hate using the term about shared vulnerabilities, but there are, um, there are certain groups that um, have, organizations aligned to them that we could work with to make sure that PrEP is brought into the conversation and delivered. And we're, we're having conversations with a number of um, organizations that particularly work with drug users and also um, and w women within those group, trans, etc. cetera. Um, but one of the biggest things is um, funding. Um, and because th there's an aspect of, even if there are champions within the service, um, it's another layer of work that they need to provide. And 
prevention, holistic prevention should be integral to what everyone does, but that unfortunately isn't always the case and it's to do with time and resources. So when we've been working with partners, we've been talking about how do we bring it into their services at minimal cost um, or doing, we're also looking at um, developing bids together so that um, they get funded to get more um, staff to bring in to, to support this conversation. So the I think the appetite is there and the, the recognition that we need to work with different partners is there, but it's just supporting those partners with, with the resources that they need. Anything to add from Kim? Up, up. Um, no, I don't think so. Um, it, I, I think it, it is about having that time and, and that conversation um, and the, um, the, the people working with the individuals feeling confident about having that conversation, which is it is um, just it's sort of casual, really, a casual conversation. Let's not make it so complicated. Mm. No, I completely agree. And I, I, I think I, I just raised my hand because I, I do believe that it's really important to diversify. But I do think that within our services at, at present, at within present. our sexual health services within the UK, we are not providing what we need to provide optimally. So I think if we focus within our services and provided the prep awareness education and provision that we should be doing um, I think we would come a long way as well so definitely go to other services but I think we also need to um, as I always say up our game <laughs> within our services too. I'm, I'm trying to go to the Ukraine once again to Olga because some of the questions coming up in the chat refer directly to the situation in Ukraine and to your experience in the context of injecting drug use. So there is one remark here. It comes from, I think it's Anton again, and but I've, I see it by several of the participants who claim that we need more diversity when it comes to access or entry points. And I wonder from your experience, Olga, what other entry points that you would like to think of? So are we talking of key populations? Are we talking of people who inject drugs or we talk of all others? Sorry, both. Both. Mm -hmm. both. So for a key population, I think it, a key populations, I think it is easier uh, since services are already there and we are reaching people in need with uh, HIV prevention, harm reduction, more than 200 uh, uh, to 200,000 people a year. Oh, I think I got frozen. No, you can hear me? No, okay. I, I think you need to repeat it. Right. Um, uh, so uh, when we talk of key populations, I think we already have quite an established network of entry points. These are harm reduction, HIV prevention services. And as for Ukraine, we have just started using social network strategy uh, for HIV testing as a way to reach uh, partners of people who inject drugs, injecting and sexual uh to reach them with information about prep with referral and social support so that uh just an example of the entry point because this strategy allows us uh allows us to um reach those people who are not coming to the ngos but come through the network through the chain that's the chain recruitment uh, but this is very uh known nothing special uh, if we get to uh, to the populations who are not covered by the conventional HIV prevention services. Then, of course, as uh, Yanis and colleagues mentioned, we need diversity of points. So we, I think we already mentioned those uh, uh, GPs, family physician, obstetric gynecologists, like uh, just don't make a big deal about that and have it as a part of, uh, of a healthcare package. But I have a thought on that. Um, uh, as a big and great idea, it sounds very nice that we will make PrEP available for everyone through whatever means, I don't know, just go to the post office or to the supermarket, have it at the mobile uh, ambulatory, whatever, but uh, it, uh, it will take some time, because even in Ukraine, we are now trying to make a family physician uh, physicians to 
uh, to take care of the HIV positive uh, patients. And it, it takes some effort. You have to train family physicians. You, can, you have to allocate some resources to motivate them and so on and so forth. So maybe for the sake, I mean, I'm not saying that diversifying this pots of prep delivery, points of prep delivery is not real, but just to have an idea of still identifying those other most, at risk groups and we can we can actually already think of that so just have it as two parallel processes because if we just if we are going to rely on uh, providing prep everywhere by uh, every physician to all the general populations at risk uh, again it will take some time and we don't want to lose that time with uh, uh, with uh, targeting services uh, to somebody who we can already guess can be at risk yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Olga. And um, those of you who follow the chat have learned that uh, Akiko and Glenda have joined us and that I would like to hear, I, I don't really see Akiko's um, uh, 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 face here. I wonder if my screen is too, too small, but um, Akiko, you have put something in the chat that I would like to hear aloud from you. Um, are you there? Oh. Hi, um, Harriet. I am. Can you hear? Yeah, like like Sophie, not not very no. consistently. So I, I I might read out what you put in the chat. Okay. Is is my connection still um, sounding a re really bad? No, that sounds a little bit better, Akiko. I would really like to hear from you because I'm aware that you yeah. are someone who uses PrEP or has used PrEP and were asked especially to come and talk to us. So um, by all means... We really please. want your first-hand experience. Yes. <laughs> uh, well, my name is Akiko and I um, basically um, work closely with Sophie, which um, who I've met from Chelsea and Westminster. And to be honest with you, I came from the Philippines and... In a conservative country, it was very, very difficult to discuss such things as PrEP because it's a conversation that is not being opened easily because of, you know, the religion, um, you know, the religion effect in the country. So having um, the access um, to PrEP in this country makes me really feel more comfortable because I have to say that the advisors and the people who are professionals in these things makes makes make us feel um, we can rely on them. But to be to be fair, but I feel like the advisor should also um, work work more on making the individuals more reassured that they 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 should be okay and they, it should it should not be an embarrassing um, topic to discuss in their circles. Because for me, I believe that even though the social media is a very powerful tool that people use these days, it's still the word of mouth that really makes a difference. Because if people can hear this aloud, then I feel that they will eventually um, spread more about this stuff, you know, because they would feel more comfortable talking about it in an open circle where people, where people would listen. And May, may, I, may I ask you, do you remember when you heard first about PrEP? Uh, through my whom? friends, through my friends, definitely and through my friends, because I wouldn't, I couldn't imagine, I couldn't imagine PrEP being advertised on social media, and I don't think that people um, would really, you know, would really pay attention to this stuff on, um, on, you know, from what they see online. It's almost like if you see an advertisement on clothing through Insta stories or um, advertisements on Facebook, they, you, we skip through these stuff. How long are you being on PrEP now? I don't use PrEP every day. I use it as, a, um, as an occasional. On um, demand. Yeah, like, um, yeah, like last minute, like when, when, when I have to see or when I, ha when I have to get ready for somebody, like a casual partner or something. So that's basically how I use it. But um, I've been on it since the trial. So until now, I'm still depending on it whenever it's needed. And to be fair, it has, it definitely puts me at ease and it puts me on, you know, it puts a, like, it puts me at a peace of mind, not mm -hmm. to worry about 
anything. Like, if anything does happen or goes wrong, then yeah. Thank, thank you, Akiko. And I th I'm going to ask Glenda um, a very similar question. Glenda, do you remember when you first heard of PrEP? And by whom did you learn about PrEP? Uh, hi, yeah. Um, I heard about PrEP through my friends, I think. Yeah, through my friends. And I've been using PrEP but occasionally, but not every day. Um, I've been using since a year ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I use that only for casual partners and stuff. Not every day. Every day. <laughs> yeah. And wh wh where do you get the, 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 the prep from? You have the National Health Service in, in the UK. Where do you go to? Um, do you go to BART? <laughs> I, I go to Dean Street. Yeah. I... Because I, I I talked to my one of my um advisors there that I'm I'm a bit actively like um not not these days but before I'm a, a bit active so they suggested me to to get prep but first my my friend told me uh, already about that I think it's Akiko <laughs> I think it's Akiko as well <laughs> so I I said okay I I will I will I will have a look I will um listen to them first before I take it. So, yeah. So thank you, very, okay. thank you very much, Akiko and Glenda for sharing your firsthand experience. And it very well connects to the, the presentations we have heard. I think it's, I'm getting the news now that we have only two more minutes to go. And uh, this means I have to hand back to, um, to Gus for the final words, but uh, not without saying thanks to all of you staying with us in this uh, challenging technical situation. And I'm looking forward very much to Gus uh, summarizing this. And thanks again to the presenters and the um, people who discussed with us. And please make sure to save the chat. There's been a lot of lots of uh, important um, uh, information in it. And thanks back to Gus. Yes, thank you. I intend to write up a report for both of these webinars uh, because I think they've been really important. I was so glad to get Akiko and Glenda there uh, at the end. It's really important to have the voice of PrEP users. Um, so PrEP using women on, 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 uh, on the webinar. Um, yes, um, thanks for the people who... Um, so apologies for the uh, calendar misinformation and for those of you who joined early. Um, uh, commiserations to uh, Sophie for her dodgy internet connection. Talk to your providers. Good grief. Um, but um, it's awful when technology lets you down. Um, but I think that's been a very rich webinar and in com combination with the last one, I think there's a lot to think about. I was trying to summarize this as I went along. Um, and the, th the three big points that I'm hearing is firstly that uh, women may uh, talk about and think about um, their risks of HIV and their sexual health risks in very different ways and in a broader context than gay men do. And we have to meet women where they are and help them to have the discussions that they want that, that um, PrEP provision at least must be seen as a much more dialogic um, thing with, with um, HIV. Um, uh, and if I can find my own summary earlier, as my, here we are, um, that the lack of specific provision for um, people who inject drugs is a theme, and I think that Western Europe in particular needs to catch up on that, especially as we are now seeing a new uh, rise of risk um, in gay men who inject drugs during chem sex, um, uh, we need to take PrEP provision to the places women actually use for health and sexual health. Um, that means, um, really, I think we have to have, we have to raise awareness in um, the healthcare practitioners that work in those places as well, because we can't suddenly switch PrEP provision to uh, um, family planning clinics, gynecologists, etc., without training the professionals. Um, and I think those are the big themes that have come out, but there have been quite a few more. Thank you very much for sticking with us. Uh, for um, There's still 38 people here, and we had up to 50, which is twice the number we had in the previous uh, webinar. So that was great. Thank you very much. And I will be sending out um, a uh, report, which will be on the Prep in Europe website. It won't happen yet because I've got the IAS conference to go to. But thank you very much. Any final words, Harriet? 
Yes, a, a huge uh, spasiba to our interpreters and um, very happy that you helped us. Okay, goodbye everybody and thanks for sticking with us and I hope you, uh, I hope it was really useful. <laughs>